Hi, my name is Gal Lawrence and thanks for tuning into my podcast today. If you're enjoying these conversations and you want to check out more of this transformational work, be sure to come back to guylawrence.com.au and join me as we go further down the rabbit hole. Enjoy the show. Mitch, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Guy. I appreciate it. Great to be here. I have to say, it's funny how things come full circle because... Yeah. I watched your documentary, DMT, The Spirit Molecule. I think it must have been 2011, something like that. That would probably be about right, yeah. Okay, and I had no idea what the hell DMT was. I had no idea what the Spirit Molecule thing, Imajiggy, was. And I remember watching that movie just going, no way, holy (laughs) shit. Yeah. Yeah. And... And it sat with me for months, like, like it, it really did. And, and it made me start to question everything. And it put me, in, put me on to Joe Rogan, who I'd never heard of at the time either. Okay. I <laughs> and, love how it, yeah. And, it, and then in 2013, I found myself trying DMT. Okay. Uh, which I was terrified. But at the same time, it, was, it really was a very... <laughs> powerful experience that I think is, is certainly shaping who I am today. So I've got a lot to thank you for, I guess. Well, thank you for, for tuning in. And, and uh, absolutely. I'm glad we could put that thing out there. It, it had the same effect for me. Um, never heard of it, came across it, tried it, and life was never been the same in an amazing, amazing way. So. Yeah. Wow. Well, look, before we, before we get into D, uh, DMT and dimethyltryptamine and everything, I always ask everyone, if you were on an airplane and a stranger sat next to you and asked you what you did for a living, what would you say? <laughs> That's a great question. I like that. I, um, you know, I've been struggling with how to define what I do over the last five to six years um, because filmmaker just doesn't seem to encapsulate everything anymore. Um, that had always been the case. And it's like, oh yeah, I'm a filmmaker. I'm a filmmaker. Uh, at the same time, really, since the film came out, uh, that has opened up a lot. And I've been diving more into philosophy. And this is where the conversation always gets interesting on the airplanes. <laughs> uh, philosophy and technology and just human evolution as well. Um, and so that conversation usually goes you know, one or two ways. It's like, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, and then we just kind of shut it down. <laughs> Or there's a spark there, and there's usually a spark um, on, on some level. And I always look for something that is going to resonate with the person that I'm chatting with, um, and trying to get a read off of where are they coming from, um, mm-hmm. who are they in this world, and and what's going to to sound enticing or at least open up some some level of curiosity. Um, so it's a number of things, I guess. Yeah, definitely, and it, it's definitely one of those things. If if your ears prick up the, the the depth of this conversation. Well, hopefully people will, will appreciate it today as well, where we cover. Um, was did you always want to be a filmmaker, and did you ex- ever expect to be then making a movie about DMT? Like, how did all that converge in your life? Um, well, great question. I I was raised in a, in a family of storytellers, I, I guess, and um, and. My dad was a politician, but also worked in the banking world. And he was always really good orator. And I, you know, to hear him to speak. And my mom was a business owner as well, but she also had a way of being able to just connect and, and to communicate well with people and that would make them feel included as, as part of the conversation and also feel like, and I always picked up on that and saw the power of that. And, and not power in the sense of how do I control this, um, but, but what it did for everybody involved in that communication. Um, and then also the storytelling aspect from kind of the, the mythological level. That, that was always something that intrigued me and, and coming across different mythologies always fascinated me. Um, and I guess the first time it really resonated with me that, hey, I wanna be a filmmaker, um, I was probably in eighth or ninth grade and I was reading Jim Morrison's biography out of all things. <laughs> And prior to him becoming a musician, uh, he wanted to be a filmmaker. So went to film school and Jim being Jim, uh, kind of challenged quite a few people in his class with a short film that he made about sadomasochism and Nazis. And you can imagine in the early 60s that that still had some some pretty heavy resonance with people and and really got angered a lot of people in class. They were yelling at him as the story goes. Um, but I just saw that emotion that came out from that. And I thought, wow, 
um, if you can do that with a film, what are the possibilities? Um, and I just thought I, I want to do something that can have that same sort of power, but in a very positive way. And so that was my first click to say, I want to be a filmmaker. And I didn't really know that I would be making the spirit molecule or anything related to psychedelics. Um, in fact, I had visions of making fiction films. That's what I wanted to go do is direct feature films. Um, <clears throat> but in my kind of early teens, I started dabbling in psychedelics myself and at the time, I'd say that was more of an escape as opposed to kind of an opening up and, and more discovery or self-discovery. But there were several, several experiences that were a lot more than just going out to a party and, and getting high right. and something that hit me and, and always stuck with me. I wasn't quite sure what that was, but there was something more there. Um, and it also just tied back into prior to even touching psychedelics. I had a lot of mystical experiences as a child. Oh, really? Um, I had a lot of experiences. Yeah. With entities, uh, dreams where I was, where I felt I, I couldn't even put the words to it at the time, but astral projection and just being able to get out of my body flying around. But these, these experiences were, were more real than real. Uh, they felt like they were something other than just this physical reality. Um, and then DMT came into my life right before my last year of grad school. Um, and this was in 2002. I had left psychedelics for a long time, hadn't really touched them. And a friend of mine was moving back to Brazil. He said, hey, a group of us are getting together. Come on by. And uh, so I never heard of DMT. Um, kind of was like, well, I've done LSD. I know what this is all about. The guy just kind of looked at me and laughed. He said, do you want to do this or not? I said, sure. Um, but had the most profound experience. I had the full ego death, um, felt like I was dying in that first minutes of experience. He, he saw the look of fear on my face and literally <clears throat> the second or within the first minute of coming back from that 10 minute experience, something clicked in me that said, you've got to make a movie about this. And wow. that's how it all kind of started. And, uh, I didn't want to touch DMT again until I, I learned some more about it. So I spent about four years just researching as much as I could. And uh, Dr. Strassman's book popped up and, and that's how we got here. Wow. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> it's taken me back to when I tried it actually, because I, I think I had the same mm. thing. I was just terrified for the first minute or two. I had no right. idea what was going on. I had no one. It's like you, I don't know. It's almost like there's this, it's almost like we've been looking through a slither of reality and then it, and then it's just like somebody like goes whoop and pulls open the curtain you know um right. which is really hard to comprehend but maybe we should explain what dmt is sure. maybe let's go there yeah so dimethyltryptamine commonly referred to as dmt is probably the most profound psychedelic or psychoactive that, that we know about um, because of its short duration and also because of its kind of otherworldly nature. A lot of people describe going to other places, um, being visited by entities that could be a, any range of things from aliens to angels. Uh, but to me, one of the most fascinating parts about dimethyltryptamine is that it uh, comes straight from tryptophan. So it's a, a, you know, from amino acid and a basic building block of life and is not only made in our own bodies, um, goes through the blood-brain barrier, it's in our lungs, in our urine, flowing throughout us, but throughout nature, um, all mammals, plant, certain plants have it, and, and potentially every living organism has dimethyltryptamine within it. Um, and if you start thinking about what that potentially means, um, as uh, Leanna Standish said in the film, a common molecular language amongst all living beings, that changes the way that we start to interact i think mm -hmm. um and really opens up again something bigger why are people having such otherworldly experiences where they're tapping into what they feel is kind of like an information scape of reality um, and so that's kind of the basics of it um, and then some human research was done by dr rick strassman in the 90s and that's what the film was about Okay. Okay. And um, why the, the, the thing that occurred to me then, if it's ever mm -hmm. present within us and we produce it, mm -hmm. why aren't we? Why is it not being activated? Right. Um, well, I think it is being activated, but I think it's on such minute levels that right. we just don't have these overwhelming kind of spiritual experiences all the time. Um, it does play some role in how we're perceiving reality because it's in our bodies, and you know it doesn't have Got to it. be all the way through to super psychedelic state, 
But the fact that it's there, it's part of our normal, how we're regulating our space and time and how we're perceiving, how we're seeing. And some people that might have higher levels of it or might have a little bit less of uh, MOAI or the, the you know, oxidase inhibitor, I always get tripped up on that one. <laughs> um, then, then there might be times where they're going to have a little bit larger experience. Yeah, yeah, for sure. That's definitely happened to me since just from mm -hmm. my own personal practice. But I mean, from my understanding, it, it, uh, was, uh, the pineal gland produces it, which, which. That's the theory. That's, that's the, the theory, it. right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That which was could, what Dr. Strassman had put out there. And a lot of people have taken it since then and say it's definitely produced by the pineal gland. We don't know that, but there is some good indication that that might be the case now because since Dr. Strassman stopped his work with humans in the 90s, he started doing some animal research and they have targeted and said that the pineal gland seems to be producing DMT, um, at, least in, at least in mice. So, yeah. yeah, well, maybe we should get into uh, Dr. Strassman and how you guys came across because obviously he played a big part in, in your documentary. So, um, yes. <laughs> so what happened? You, you've had this profound experience. You're thinking, right, I'm going to make a movie on this one day. Yeah. How, how did this serendipity work from there? Yeah. So I just started getting online, reading as much as I could, and then found DMT, the spirit molecule, the book by Dr. Rick Strassman. Oh. And I immediately ordered the book <laughs> and just kind of devoured it. And I thought this that, that to me resonated at the time, like this is the way that the story could be told because originally based on my experience, I was like, this is going to be the weirdest, trippiest movie ever made. <laughs> and it really was going to kind of be off the wall. But then once I got that and I started to look at it from kind of a scientific and a spiritual perspective, I thought that those two things had to come together in some way and, 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 and merge. Um, and so Dr. Strassman did a wonderful job of, of doing that. I mean, he came from a very scientific background, a psychiatrist. Uh, what he was really looking at or studying, <clears throat> at least to the FDA and the DEA, was about the physiology of what's happening in a human being when they're under different levels of DMT. Hmm. And now what came out of that was a lot more and the experiences were a lot more. Um, but that's, that's so, you know, once I read that book, I said, this is a great way to tell a story. I just reached out, um, contacted Dr. Strassman and said, hey, I would love to make this into a film. Um, he was open to it, but he had also had others that had contacted him and said, yeah, I want to make a movie. So I think he was a little, yeah, we'll see if this happens. Um, we chatted for about a year and put some things to place. And then I went out and visited him in, in New Mexico. And we started a month after we met for the first time. So that wow. was in January 2007 and uh, brought him on board as a producer. And he was integral in making so much of it happened, bringing in all the people that we interviewed um, and helping guide kind of the, the structure of the narrative as well. Got so. it. And, and essentially, so, so Dr. Strassman in the 90s did a legalized study with r random people, correct? That's correct. Yeah, from yeah. 1990 to 1995, basically. Yeah, wow. And then you invited them all back. So this would have been 10 years oh, later gosh. or more even, even more. Yeah, even more than that. Yeah, I think it was 2007 when we started. So yeah, we're looking at you know 12 years, something like that. By the time they all came, and we brought back 10 of the the volunteers that were part of the study, and then we interviewed about 40 other you know from philosophers to psychiatrists, psychologists, um, just any number of people that that had been tied into the psychedelic movement uh, since the 60s even. Yeah, got it. What, what really resonated with me and really challenged me because, because look, I, I'm a Welshman. I grew up in the valleys of Wales. Like it's not, <laughs> it's not an everyday conversation back home. I can tell you, sure. <laughs> you know, but, but when watching the film, the, the, the people I could relate to, it wasn't like people had just run out of the hills with, with long hair and just, you know, mm -hmm. hadn't been seen in three weeks or something like, you know, this, this, <laughs> <laughs> this was everyday people. Talking, Absolutely. talking about these experiences. Yeah, and particularly you know, with, the, with the volunteers themselves, I, I think they, they looked at a wide range of group and brought in different people from all walks of life, mothers to psychiatrists to psychonauts, if you want to go there. But I think they had a good range of folks. And I think part of the criteria was that they had to have at least some psychedelic experience before. It didn't have to be dimethyltryptamine. Um, and most of these people, if they had that or they did have that, it was you know once or twice, maybe back when they were in their teenage years or early 20s and they'd never had anything like this. 
but I found them all very relatable, um, easy to talk to, uh, and uh, even even all of the uh, the quote unquote experts that we had on. Uh, there were some heavy, heady conversations in there, and uh, getting through all of that, distilling down 100 hours of footage down to, we use 1% of our interview footage actually in the film. So there's wow. a lot of other stuff there, and, and I'll give a lot of credit to my editor, uh, Nevi Owens, who is, who is amazing at what she does and really helped, it took us about two years to kind of get through that big chunk of footage and really whittle it down to what is that core story uh, that's yeah. based so, Absolutely. And we tried to make them relatable as much as possible. Yeah. So that was it. Yeah. Well, it's 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 an incredible topic. What well, would when um what was your hope for the movie before you released it? Yeah, it's another good question because I part of me always had a sense because of the experience that I had with it that I wasn't as long as I put together a well polished film and that that told a cohesive story that it was just going to do its own thing. Um, and in many ways it has, um, it's found people all over the world. We still get people that come to it that have never heard of it. Um, and my goal was just to really get this information out. I wasn't looking to make a buck. I wanted to, to, to put this information out and let people kind of decide for themselves and see what happens. And I think we've made an impact, um, at least opening up some, some points of conversation. I think since we released the film out here in the States, and I think there's some new research starting to happen in, in Australia, but things have changed dramatically, and we're starting to look at what psychedelics in general can teach us um, and help us heal from and help us understand ourselves better. Uh, and that's really what I wanted more than anything, I guess, or my hope was, is that we could start to have a conversation that wasn't based just around fear, um, and it wasn't based off of propaganda. Um, a lot of that was early on, and, and I understand how that happens, but I wanted to at least have an open conversation about it, and, yeah. and I think that has started to happen. So. Oh, yeah. Well, like I said, it, you know, it, it, it's changed me. And, and mm -hmm. you know, the ripple effect is like I'm out here passionately recording podcasts every week <laughs> and, you know, passing on different information as well. So, it, you know, I mean... How many times has that movie have been viewed by people and impacted them in some way? It's oh, mind blowing. It right? is quite a bit. I, I have a rough guesstimate of about 60 million, but it could be 20 million more than that, and it could be less. But I think we've hit quite a few people. Wow. I mean, I hear the, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't it the most downloaded movie on Netflix when it, when it aired on Netflix? What, yeah, what we heard, and I, they don't give us the numbers exactly, but I heard for the first couple of weeks it was on Netflix, it was the most viewed movie on Netflix. Yeah. Um, and that was ahead of other Hollywood films and things that were out there. So we had an audience and, and it resonated with people. I think even those that, that had not had the experience or were completely unfamiliar with this, we wanted to make it accessible for others. And, and you know, I feel like we were able to do that, even though it was heavy stuff. Yeah, fair enough. Well, what, what would your advice be then to people? They watch this movie, mm. they start questioning things. Yeah. <laughs> You know, what, 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 would you, what would you say to someone that would maybe even curious of looking at this and, and trying it or exploring it for themselves? Sure. I, I think first off, I always encourage people to do their research. Um, don't just go from the film, but get out there and read. There's a lot of information online now. Um, you can look at all the different research that's happening. Um, talk to people. Don't just run out and try to take this. I don't think psychedelics are for everyone. Um, I think there's some reasons to be cautious with psychedelics. Uh, people that have psychosis in the family as a, as a history, um, schizophrenia, things like that, you need to be a little cautious with this stuff because I think that it can trigger things. Um, at the same time, if people are interested and they feel like they're, they're grounded and that they have, uh, they've done their research and have a safe, safe source for that. Um, mm -hmm. you know, keep in mind it is illegal. And so either look at places to go do that or countries to do that, that it is legal. Um, and be safe, be safe. Make sure that you're with people that you know, that you trust, um, that can take care of you. Cause sometimes you can get into some very, uh, deep places and you need somebody there that really knows what they're doing to, to help guide you. Um, yeah. So please don't just run out and frivolously try this. Um, do the research and, and find people that, that care and that you trust. Yeah, beautiful. Yeah. Well, what's your view then with, like, with your experiences? Because I know you've, you've explored um, plant-based medicine as well. Um, mm -hmm. with, um, and for me, I, I've, like, um, I've done one ayahuasca journey 
you know, to explore that because obviously dimethyltryptamine is part of the, the, the ayahuasca. Exactly. Yeah. And um, what, what, with all your experiences, how do you view what's going on in terms of reality and consciousness? Like what are your beliefs around all of that? Yeah. Well, I, let me start out really wide if I could, before I Please, come back yeah. to kind of the human <laughs> perspective. Um, because of my experiences with DMT and also what I've been looking at over the last you know, decade since we put it out more or less, <clears throat> is that I think the universe itself is conscious hmm. um, and that it has been evolving and becoming more and more conscious since quote unquote the Big Bang or whatever that launch into existence is. And if you could just do a thought experiment with me, if we're starting off and, and let's say the Big Bang happens, we start to get simple um, elements of, you know, we got hydrogen and then it starts to go into helium and, and imagine that complexity starting to grow and clumping together. And then we slowly get matter or not even slowly, but quickly get matter. Um, we get stars, we get solar systems, planets. And then from our planet, let's just look at life on, on planet Earth, you know, roughly four and a half billion years ago or four billion years ago, we start getting single cell organisms, which I think can correlate to having hydrogen again. Um, and then that starts to build and complexify and get into denser and denser states until we come up with humans. Um, and so I see this as kind of a, <clears throat> where elements are almost figments in this entire beautiful cosmos um, and that it is also conscious. Um, and I think when we take some of these psychedelics, what happens is we can peer into that. We can, we can see different layers of our own consciousness, but we can also peer into quote unquote one um, and, and understand that we are part of something much, much bigger. Uh, we're not disconnected from that. Although sometimes it may feel like that on planet earth, mm -hmm. that humans are separate from nature. I don't think we're separate from nature at all. We are nature. Um, people talk about technology being separate um, and artificial intelligence. Well, it's coming straight from us. It's coming straight from natural products. It's just a different complexity that's coming out of that. And so what it started to show me is that everything, even inanimate objects, um, in some way, shape, or form have consciousness. Uh, and that that changes the way that I perceive the world and also interact with it. I'm not saying I'm perfect by any means. I struggle with things on a daily basis being human, but it does start to change the way I, I, I talk to people, hopefully, and how I might open a door or just smile at somebody, um, how I take care of the planet a lot better than I used to. Um, and, and what that does, it's, it's like, you know, when you throw a, pond, a rock in a pond and you see those ripples go out, this stuff, everything that we do and everything that we say has a ripple effect on those that are around us, um, our family, our friends, our lovers, um, even the environment. All of those things are being influenced and we're being influenced by it as well. Um, and so again, <laughs> big broad perspective, but from what I've come to, um, I think it's all alive and conscious. Yeah, no, I, I resonate with every single thing you say because I've had embodied experiences mm -hmm. that make me connect with that instantly. And, and until I actually had embodied experiences, and I've said this before on the show, it, it felt just from the intellect. But, right. the mo you know, but the moment it got beyond the intellect to a deeper understanding, then that changed, changes everything. I mean, I've had experiences where I felt like you said, you're just part of, you just, all of a sudden you, you're like this individual drop and all of a sudden you do become part of the ocean. You're part of the cosmos part, right. and you realize you're part of that. And when you have these experiences and you feel a connection to something or, or an emotion, uh, for me, it was love. Like I felt this, yeah. this feeling that I'd never, um, didn't even know if it was possible. Like I felt love, but not to this amplified Right. Uh, way of being and then when you come back and come in back into life you just think oh my god you got a different you got a new reference point <laughs> right well and that love that universal love uh, it's so different in the way that i think we just just describe and feel love here a lot of times it's this there is no judgment whatsoever yeah it's just that, that it is it just is um, and that seems to be a common, common experience for people that take these, these compounds. Um, and that's the other interesting part to me is 
the commonality in these experiences for people. Uh, they get simplified, but they're also completely amazing and overwhelming in, um, in a very positive way, um, in ways that just, we don't need to hold on to a lot of the shit that we hold on to. Yeah. We, we give it so much meaning, don't we? We and do. And it's not yeah. necessary. I don't think so. You know, yeah. and we, we lose the, the essence of what it is to be human. Mm -hmm. And what's your thoughts on this? Because from my own experience, and like I have a meditation practice, I, I practice most days. And it's like when I start having a few of the experiences, it was almost like new circuitry within me was, was being developed and evolved almost to, to allow, I don't know, it's like almost like to allow my own consciousness to run better. It's like um, having a software and hardware up, upgrade. That's exactly, I, I love that analogy because I think it works so well with our modern times. It's like we just kind of wipe the hard drive clean. We put a new operating system on, but we can develop new patterns of energy flow in our bodies and in our minds. It's exactly. That, it's that simple. Um, and there's, it doesn't have to be all new agey or anything else. It's, it can be that simple. And, and what we're starting to realize with, with trauma, for instance, particularly with these medicines, is that our traumas are stored in our, our nervous system. They're not stored right here. There's a relationship that's going on there, but really what's being, what's embedded there are these energetic patterns of am I safe or am I not safe? Do I need to run? Do I need to fight? Um, is my nervous system anxious and heightened? Um, and what you can start to do with these is, is reform those patterns um, and start to, to teach yourself that, yes, I am okay. Um, or if I'm not, what do I need to do to, to make myself okay or to get out of a situation or a relationship that may not be in my benefit? Uh, but we're seeing that we can actually reprogram ourselves, which is fascinating to me, <laughs> just absolutely fascinating. Well, it is because then every time I go into a meditation practice or, or in my own personal journey, because I have a new reference point, right. it's like I know where to navigate now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and it's like dropping the little flagpoles. Yeah, right? exactly. And then, and then, <laughs> almost in my own experiences, you, got, you could kind of like it's almost like there's a quickening of 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 learning or allowing and the surrendering mm -hmm. to it, and it seems to be just getting uh, picking up speed. I don't know. Right. So, right. Yeah. No, I think you're right. I think there is that you kind of move the stuff out of the way that's that's slowing us down or blocking us, and as some of those things start to fall away, it's like. Doo -doo 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 -doo. Okay, yeah. the next, do, 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 do. <laughs> it does have yeah. a tendency to kind of speed up. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, one other thing I want to touch on as well is, is plant-based medicine and ayahuasca because I know you looked at that and, and I, I, cause I checked out your, um, on the IMDB profile and I didn't realize you were involved into stepping into the fire. Um, ah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> which was another, another film that influenced me uh, because of that. I went and did the plant-based medicines. Okay. Yeah, it was, um, it was early on that I was involved in that. And, and Rob, who was putting that together, was, um, was one of the investors in the spirit molecule and really helped us make the spirit molecule happen. Um, and it was right around the time we were finishing shooting and the editing process where I, where I met him and started to think that I'd be putting that together. Um, and then he decided to go a different direction. But um, I was involved in that early on. I wasn't part of the final piece, but... Um, and, you know, that's been another great thing about the work from the spirit molecule of how many other projects have been popping up. And I've been lucky right. to be involved in some other ones. We just, I know you talked to my colleague, Steve McDonald, and yeah. we just had a tour about From Shock to Awe, uh, which is looking at veterans coming back and finding plant medicines as well. Um, another one that I worked on was called A New Understanding, which is looking at the Johns Hopkins psilocybin research with cancer patients. Um, and the wow. other part that's just that we're just starting to uh, that I've just come on to consult on is a new one about Stan Groff uh, called the really the, the psychonaut yeah and for those that don't know Stan Groff I highly encourage you to to look at his work not only is he a psychedelic pioneer and psycho psychedelic psychotherapy pioneer but also developed holotropic breath work um, and Stan is a visionary and amazing man and, and needs a story out there more. So. Wow, that's going to be fascinating. Have you, have you researched much on the breathwork side of things so far? I haven't, but now that, you know, it's always kind of been on the outskirts for me, um, for my people that I know that have been done it and they swear by it and I've just never gotten around to doing it. Um, but then 
now with this project coming up, it's like I better start studying up a little bit and go do my own my own thing. And so I'm, I'm looking at some sessions coming up uh, in February and May. Yeah, How right. About you, have you done any of that breath work? Or? I have, yeah, 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 okay. yeah, and it's been, yeah. Look, I, I've had I've had experiences stronger than than um, my ayahuasca from just meditation and breath work. Um, it's, I've heard it, that it's <laughs> it's quite incredible um, what's what's possible. But I th- but I think that there's there was an element of feeling safer about it as well because it, it almost like there was a part of me that I knew I had control if I mm. choose to, when, when I did the ayahuasca ceremony, I was terrified. Like I can't tell you how terrified I was before mm. I took it because I had had a bad experience as a kid with mushrooms growing up in Wales and, oh, okay. and it, and it kind of kept me away from all psychedelic drugs full stop. But as I was evolving, I look at almost like the, the deeper part of me was wanting to grow more and my, my, my own ego self was holding me back. I realized I had to start overcoming my fears. So that's why I actually right. decided to literally step into my own fire and, 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 <laughs> and look at this work. But, but what was fascinating for me was that when I did the plant medicine and I remember taking the drink, I had to let go. I had a fully surrender. I thought, I can't fight this in any way, even though my fear is gripping me right now. And it was one of the biggest lessons I ever learned in what it means to surrender and to fully surrender and just accept whatever happens, happens. I mean, we tell ourselves that, but, you know, so... Challenging to do. Oh, mate. But yeah, it was the most challenging thing I've ever done the most ter- and the most rewarding thing I've ever done. Right. When I came out of that experience the next day, it was like the universe had given me the greatest gift because it actually, I don't know, it, it, it appreciated my full surrender. It was just right. the, str- the strangest thing, you know? Yeah, so it really is stepping into that fear as opposed to trying to push it away or not address it, but literally jumping right, up, right into it. Um, yeah. And things just change so quickly. Absolutely. And, but what that does for you in life is, of course, we have, I have fears every day. I have things come up, but I have such a different navigation relationship with those fears. And now, thanks to these experiences, it allows me to lean into th- to things much more than right. opposed to just continually pushing away, pushing away, pushing away and, and letting it manifest and grow and, and you know, um, affect us more deeply longer term. Right. You know. yeah, it's not like it just takes all your fear away. We're still human beings. We still right. feel that fear, but it does. It gives you that different navigation tool to say, all right, I don't have to run away from this. I don't have to push it away. And also I know by doing that, I'm just slowing myself down or I'm, I'm stagnating my development. Um, yeah. It gives you that opportunity to at least have that conversation in your own head to, to then go forward with it. Yeah. So and I guess uh, to wrap it up with the breath work, there's right. that element of I can control this if I choose to. So am I going to fully surrender right now or not? You know, so, so, right. so where the other way uh, was just like, no, I'm all in. Like I had to yeah. kind yeah. of thing. So it's, well, and I guess it tell me if I'm wrong, but I, I, from what I understand about the breath work, getting back to some very primal experiences that are embedded in us all the way back to the womb um, from Stan Groff's perspective is that getting back to these places of being, an infant and even you know back into the womb itself and what that experience was like for you like was that positive was it negative people you know was your mother or family abusive in any ways and, and how all that ties in going forward as a developed human being um, yeah that's yeah. amazing to me it is amazing and what's really interesting is um is because you know, I, I facilitate retreats as well. So I actually find myself breathing a lot and working with people a lot in, in this energy. And, and I actually had an experience where I'd done some breath work, but the, the release came afterwards, not during mm. the breathing itself when I, when, I, when, I, when I fell asleep. And it took me back to all these childhood experiences that I couldn't even remember in my mind. It was just, right. but it was actually... It was a beautiful thing, and it took me back there, and I felt it all starting to move through and release, and it almost became like a, um, a DMT experience. Mm-hmm. You know, it was quite incredible, and I thought, wow, that's so powerful. Um, but then being able to just surrender to it and allow it to happen was, again, a key element as opposed to just freaking out what the hell's going on, which uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> right. But it's amazing too that our bodies and minds, but particularly I think it, it's embedded into our bodies again with the nervous system, has this kind of innate ability to shake itself off. Like you would see an animal that goes through a traumatic experience out in nature, um, getting chased by a lion, for instance, but then gets away. You see it shake. Um, as humans, yeah. I don't think we're able to do that as much anymore. We've, we've developed in a way that we are not doing that. So when yeah. trauma comes in, it, it sticks and it embeds itself. Um, but that the body has that natural innate element that it can do that. It knows what to do essentially. Exactly. And we just need to trust that more, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, before I move on, because I asked everyone on the show a certain set of questions, but I got sure. one last question for you. You mentioned that you, you're looking at DMT too. Is that correct? Yeah, we're currently uh, working title is DMT, the conscious molecule. Um, and my producer contacted me, I guess, earlier this year. And actually, he'd been bugging me for a couple of years. Now, but he's like, you know, we're coming up on the 10 years after the release. And I was like, wow, yeah, we, that's right. And, and so much has changed. So what, you know, what story do you want to go tell? Uh, we don't want to have to go back and redo the spirit molecule. But what I'm looking at now, and I kind of getting back to what I said earlier about universal consciousness, what, what is going on in the universe? And there's a lot of different science that's starting to kind of point this direction that things are conscious and that our idea of consciousness, for one, we don't really know what consciousness is and we can't fully define it. Um, but what would it mean if the universe was conscious? Um, you know, through whole holograms we potentially look at the universe as being a big hologram mm. um uh, panpsychism is another term that gets thrown out there about everything being conscious uh, so looking at it from back to the cosmos and the early boom all the way through to now and even up to our technological development now what is what is going on there is there a transfer of consciousness into a newer form um, wow. And I think DMT is kind of playing a role in that. And it seems to have this information scape almost that has consciousness embodied in it. Um, and so that's kind of the, the long and short of what I want to put together. And we're looking at uh, making that a series. Uh, Exciting. Come out on Netflix or, or Amazon. So Is yeah. there a deadline on that then? Or could it be one year from now or six years from now? or? <laughs> I hope it's not six years from now. <laughs> but uh, we started the spirit molecule. Someone said, oh, it's going to take you at least five years. I said, no way. Well, it took five years. So oh, wow. wow. I, I think now, though, what our goal would be is to release in 2021, probably later 2021, um, and start shooting again this next year. So that, that's a couple of years. Let's say a couple of years. <laughs> yeah, fair, fair enough. Beautiful. Beautiful. I look yeah. forward to it. So, yeah, I ask uh, certain sets of questions on the show every week. And I'm always okay. intrigued by everyone's answers. They're different. Um, what's been a low point in your life that later turned out to be a blessing? Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, well, I've had a lot of different traumas in my life. I think one of the biggest ones early on um was the divorce of my parents um and the splitting up of the household at like seven years old and not really having a contextual framework for that at the age of seven and most most kids don't um that that's a really hard thing to kind of grasp um as you know these are your parents these are the ones that take care of you and that feed you and then all of a sudden they're split uh that had a, a huge impact on me um and didn't quite know how to make sense of all that but through my work with psychedelics, um, healing with MDMA, and getting different perspectives on my parents and myself in relation to that, I see that it absolutely was the best thing that could have happened. Um, and a tougher one for me, and I wouldn't say it's necessarily a blessing, but it's given me a broader perspective. I lost my brother um, almost nine years ago now uh, oh, from an wow, opiate sorry. overdose. And, and that was the most challenging thing in my life. Um, and that happened right at the time when the spirit molecule was coming out. So I had my life going in one direction and then getting pulled in a totally different direction with how to understand life and death again. And then also my, my life. What am I doing to make a difference, uh, to carry on his legacy, but also how am I living? How am I being on a day-to-day -day basis um, to myself and also with others around me? And I think in a lot of ways it helped open me up and, and change my perspectives on 
how I saw life and death and also how I was being in my life. Um, I just now, after nine years roughly, feel like I'm actually back to Mitch. And I don't even know how to fully describe what that is. Um, but that process of the last nine years of, of kind of going through the hurt and the anger and all of the different emotions that are tied up with that and just the extreme loss because he wasn't only my little brother, but he was my best friend. Um, so that, that was a challenge. Um, but it has also reinvigorated me to come out and, and help other people. Um, I, I don't want to see this kind of stuff going on and I, I want to do everything I can to, to make a difference and, and educate people hopefully off of some other options that are out there um, besides the traditional ones. So long story, but there it was, there are a couple different elements there, but um, both of those elements were probably the most profound in my life, I'd say. And yeah, no, thank you for yeah. sharing. I, 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 I always find it interesting because we all have hardships and I think it's very difficult to, to what meaning we associate to the things mm -hmm. that, that happen, you know, and, and if we're able to get a different sense of perspective on something, you know, it, it can, it can certainly help a lot of suffering and, Absolutely. you know, and, and it's been able to look at these very things that can help, help us support that when we're right. going through different things. Yeah. Um, what's one thing about yourself most people wouldn't know about? Hmm. <laughs> I don't know. I like to think I'm an open book, but, um, uh, I love hip hop. I love hip hop. <laughs> uh, it gets me moving. It gets me kind of jazzed up and moving around. And uh, I wouldn't say it's kind of in my traditional upbringing or anything like that, but it's just something that uh, I put that on and I just start moving and dancing and want to go do something. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good on you, Mitch. Yeah. Uh, what does your morning routine look like? Morning routine. Well, I love my coffee. So first thing when I get up is I go, I go to my, my local coffee shop or, or downstairs and have my coffee and read the news. I like to kind of keep abreast of what's going on in the world. And it's kind of my, you know, for the first hour, it's like, I'll just sip on my coffee, read the news, start to coordinate what's going on in the day. And, and also just kind of getting a sense of what's going on out there um, and, and how it's relating to, to my life and, and to the work that I'm doing. Yeah, fantastic. And last, uh, That'd be last too question. Exciting. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's all right. I love my coffee too, mate. I, I always love it. I love a good coffee in the morning. Um, I, I'm going to flip this question slightly, but um, if you could interview anyone from any anywhere, any time frame, you know, if you could wave a wand and you could sit there and interview them, who would it be? Do you think and why? Yeah. So I've I've got a couple. Um, Nikola Tesla would be at the top of the list. Huh fascinating man and I think way ahead of his time and was perceiving things that we still don't fully grasp in his technology and his in his inventions um, Gandhi has been another figure that that has always stuck out to me as a um, you know saint or angelic person that has come here and did a lot of good work and helped us open up to um, to a lot of different things and, and, and fight oppression um, that was another big thing that I, I was just fascinated by and his willingness to just put himself out there um, and take away all of his human aspects, not eat, fight back against these powers that seemed like they were way larger than could ever be fought back against. Um, and he did it. Um, so yeah, those two. And one last one, I guess I'd say Elvis. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I was born in Memphis, Tennessee and um, Elvis was actually in the hospital when I was being born. And I've always had this fascination with Elvis. Oh, wow. so. I've always been like, I want to talk to that guy. Like, so it kind of covers the gamut, right? You got you got a scientist, an inventor, to a spiritual leader, and uh, and Elvis, humanitarian, yeah. and then Elvis. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, it'd be great if you could blend them all into a doco. That would be one hell of a, a sitting. That would be. Yeah, maybe, yeah. Maybe, maybe that's a possibility. I have tattoos of each one of them on my on my arm, so <laughs> maybe that is the next documentary. I like that. <laughs> oh, fantastic. And uh, last thing, with everything we've covered today, um, is there anything you'd like to leave our listeners to ponder on? Yeah. Trust your instincts. Explore your curiosity. And don't believe everything you're told. <laughs> Those would probably be my three things. 
Yeah, beautiful. Yeah, isn't that true? How can we best support you, Mitch, for our listeners listening to this? Well, I think um, come and visit the website, thespiritmolecule.com. Uh, you can find our social media links on there. There's also tons of content on there that we did not put into the film. So if you want to look at any of that, we also have other films listed there that we've been a part of from, from Shock to Awe that we mentioned, A New Understanding. We'll have this new one up there soon. Um, also, my work with my colleague in Australia, Steve McDonald, um, adi.org. I'm sure he's given you these links, but <clears throat> excuse me, aadii.org. And then we're also working on a new doco series uh, over there uh, called Future Sense. So check those out. There's plenty of content on there. There's a podcast as well that, that Steve and, and our mate Nick are working on on a regular basis. And uh, just check that out. Tune into us on social media. Check out the podcast and uh, get ready for more content. Yeah, beautiful. Mitch, th thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you for your time. And, uh, and thank you for everything. It was, uh, yeah, that, that, was, that was awesome. Cool. Great. Thanks for having me. And uh, we'll look forward to doing it again sometime. Totally. 100%. Thanks, Mitch. All right. See you soon. Cheers.